With the outbreak of COVID-19, the global economy has gone into lockdown. You must stay at home. And looks to be headed for the most severe recession in living memory. But should we think about this recession as fundamentally different to other downturns, like the crash in 2008? And should it change how we think about the economy in general? In this video, I want to explore different narratives about the economy, how we measure it, and how this relates to concrete reality. Part 1. The Rhetoric of Economic Growth Technically, a recession is defined as two consecutive quarters of negative growth. This seems straightforward enough, but if you look into how we measure growth, it turns out the raw numbers go through a series of filters and adjustments before we see them. These adjustments are based on common sense, politics, values, and most crucially, ideas about what the economy should be. These then feed back into our notions of economic success and failure, including what is economically possible. For instance, the economy goes through a lot of volatility and change that isn't reported. Economist Jonathan Portes recently pointed out that every summer, Italy and France experience downturns of up to 10% of their GDP, but nobody worries and the statistics are seasonally adjusted. The post-Christmas period is another time of negative GDP growth for the West, which doesn't register with our narratives about the economy. Portes says that although the pandemic is clearly much more serious than a summer holiday, we might want to think about it in a similar way, as a deliberately induced, temporary interruption to economic activity which fulfills a social need, and which we may be able to make up for in the future. Doing what it takes to minimise harm, both health-wise and economically, should not be thought of as an alternative to doing what's best for the economy. An opposing narrative which has emerged is that people effectively need to ignore the pandemic and get back to work for the good of the economy, even if it costs lives. We have mocked our economy! And now the economy has cast its vengeance upon us all. Ultimately, when we ask about the economy, we are really asking about what society values. To understand this, we're first going to have to learn a little about our favourite measure of the economy, gross domestic product, also known as GDP. In her book, GDP, A Brief But Affectionate History, economist Diane Coyle traces the origin of the concept through to its present usage. Modern GDP measures emerged during World War II, so governments knew how much they had to fund the war effort. Over time, GDP has become a more generalised measure of how things are going, and our understanding of it has changed. GDP is supposed to measure the value of the flow of goods and services in a country over a given period of time. It's easy to imagine that this is measured in real time as transactions filter through electronically to some kind of dashboard in the government's offices. But actually, it's measured by sending a comparatively clumsy series of surveys to businesses to report their revenues, expenses and incomes. Once acquired, these raw numbers need two main adjustments. Firstly, intermediate inputs are subtracted from final sales to get value added. This is on the grounds that we shouldn't include the eggs, the flour, the sugar and the cake, which would double count the former three. This throws up some difficult questions though, especially for services. For example, is a lawyer's lunch an intermediate input into their service? Or is commuting an intermediate cost for workers in general? We will see shortly how these kinds of questions can have political implications. Secondly, raw income must be adjusted for inflation to get real income which is supposed to measure purchasing power. In practice, this means getting a basket of commonly bought commodities and measuring how their prices change. Naturally, the choice of what to include in this basket and how to weight each item is up for debate. Different choices can produce different numbers and, therefore, different ideas about whether the economy is succeeding or failing. Coyle gives an example of just how easily the numbers can be tweaked if it seems like there's something wrong with them. Over the 1990s, economic growth was consistently below expectations. Statisticians deigned to adjust it for the increase in quality in the IT sector, which they felt wasn't accounted for. This adjustment ended up retrospectively adding over one percentage point to every year of growth, a substantial revision for a number that historically hovers between 2 and 3%. Jacob Asser argues that economic growth figures can be thought of as a form of rhetoric. Through its appearance on the news, international comparisons and direct use in policy decisions, GDP serves a political purpose. Over time, as the adjustments made to GDP have changed, this has favoured certain parties and worldviews while pushing out others. Asser uses the example of the financial sector. In the past, finance was thought of as neutral, simply transferring resources from one area of the economy to another. For that reason, it wasn't counted at all in GDP growth, but over time, financiers lobbied to include it, and at this point it is probably even double counted. An alternative would be to consider finance as a drain on the economy, subtracting it from GDP numbers. Well, that's fantastic. A really smart decision, young man. We can put that check in a money market mutual fund, then we'll reinvest the earnings into foreign currency accounts with compounding interest, and it's gone.
Uh, what? Asha points out that the finances negative definition actually may have dampened our perception that things were going well before 2008 and alerted us to the possibility of such a crisis. But he disputes that there is a single right answer to the question of how to measure GDP. It is full of choices that can be debated, and answers will change over time. To give you another example, research and development was recently changed from an intermediate input to a final output, which made richer countries look better in the international scoreboards. There are also proposals for new changes to GDP which have gained traction. Ecological economists often call to adjust GDP for environmental factors on the grounds that so-called growth can just be free riding on the environment. What if we thought of natural resources as an intermediate input and took them away from growth? What if we adjusted growth downwards for damage to the environment? At this point, you might be thinking, wait, is this video just about standard criticisms of GDP, but with COVID-19 in the title? You've got some attitude, mister. Besides, you're wrong! Another concept from ecology whose importance has become clear during the pandemic is robustness or resilience, which is usually thought of as opposed to growth and deficiency in biology. For example, the human body has a lot of unused capacity, in kidneys and in lungs, which is inefficient, but this helps our body cope with adverse circumstances. In recent decades, many aspects of the economy, from health systems to supermarket supply chains, have been made to work at capacity. This is efficient, but it's not robust. And as we have seen, it's extremely vulnerable to stress. This kind of economic resilience is not something that was often discussed, even by critics of GDP, before the current crisis. But in the future, it looks like it could change our understanding of the economy. Part 2. Do we need the economy? When people talk about the economy, they usually have something concrete in mind. Employment, widely available goods and services, innovation, enough income, and once upon a time, this was even rising incomes. Sensible narratives must have some relationship to these realities, and must also be coherent on their own terms. So, not every way of splicing the economic story is valid. Far from it. There are plenty of bad answers to the question of how to measure and think about the economy. The idea that we must return to work to fix the economy during a pandemic is what happens when our narratives about the economy get so detached from reality that they no longer make sense. That you, um, you had, you, you, you want, you want him to... Obviously, people, healthy people, are necessary for production. And if they die, it won't help the economy by any sensible measure. One recent paper showed that areas which took more social distancing measures during the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic probably did better over the longer term by a number of metrics. But growth in the economy can be detached from economic reality more generally. When the gains from growth are not widely felt, the story told by those who benefit stops resonating with those who don't. Oren Cass of the conservative think tank American Compass has highlighted how the widespread perception that a lot of families in the USA are struggling is not reflected in economic statistics. One reason is quality adjustments. According to the statisticians, a car can double in price, but if its radio becomes digitised and its seats get more comfortable, that won't count as a real rise in price because the car has improved. Cass moves away from standard measures of inflation to calculate a cost of thriving index, which asks how long a male breadwinner must work to pay for his family's essentials such as health, travel and education. The cost of thriving has risen steadily over time, to the point that the number of working weeks required to pay for a year of essentials recently reached 53. That is, it takes more time to pay for the essentials than a worker has. This measure definitely has problems. For example, too much weighting of higher education and the use of the male breadwinner model, something Cass acknowledges. But he is correct to identify that there is a list of essentials which, when push comes to shove, are what people care about most. When we think about survival over the course of the pandemic, we naturally ask where we will get food, how people will be treated medically, how we will get around when necessary, who will educate the bloody children, and whether utility provision will continue, especially, of course, Wi-Fi. Asa argued that financial services should not count as contributions to the economy, but historically some have taken this argument much further. Classical economists like Smith and Marx used to distinguish between productive and unproductive labour. For Marx, productive labour under capitalism was limited to things you can drop on your foot, and this alone was the source of value and therefore profit for capitalists. Gross statistics in the Soviet Union did not really include services for this reason. Another way to think about the distinction is more subjective. I've been reading David Graeber's bullshit jobs, and although I have concerns about the quality of some of the evidence he uses, he identifies something I think a lot of us recognise, jobs which seem to have minimal or even negative social value, as reported by the very people employed in them. According to polls in the UK and Netherlands, the number of people who think their jobs are bullshit is up to 40%, and it seems this pandemic will serve as a partial test of this idea. As with the financial sector, we could fairly ask whether we could consider certain occupations and industries neutral or negative for GDP. 
This would actually be closer to the view of Simon Kuznets, a pioneer of modern GDP measures who specified that he wanted to ignore things like advertising, the military, and finance. Coyle and Benjamin Mitra Khan have argued that the focus on GDP as a measure of welfare is just a mistake, no matter how much we tweak it. As an alternative to thinking about the flow of income, they propose we think about people's access to six different stocks of resources – physical, natural, human, digital, social, and financial. From the beginning of the pandemic, an argument made by the left has been that the proactive measures taken by government show that progressive policies were always possible. While I agree with this, there is an easy counter-argument that austerity fixed the roof while the sun was shining, and now there's space for temporary spending in an emergency. There's an emergency. If it's an emergency, then... But this will likely be followed by even worse cuts in the future. Thinking about the economy in terms of resilience, essentials, and stocks of resources instead of GDP flips this narrative on its head. Far from fixing the roof while the sun was shining, austerity has destroyed our capacity to handle such a crisis. On the other hand, this way of thinking gives us some grounds for optimism. Using Coyle and Mitra Khan's taxonomy, human capital and net financial capital are, to my mind, the only two resources directly affected by the pandemic and social isolation measures. One way of thinking about policy during this crisis could be in minimising the damage to these stocks of resources while keeping production of essentials going. Arguably, this is in line with the actions of governments across the world, although I haven't seen it said out loud, and we have to ask if we'd prefer to keep this understanding of the economy in the future. Thanks for watching this video. Please like and subscribe for more videos about economics. If you have any thoughts on how we measure and think about the economy and economic policy, I'd love to hear them.